Welcome to Safe Active Play, a professional development program for early childhood professionals. This online training program will show you how to keep young children safe while they engage in vigorous physical activity. Giving kids regular opportunities to run, jump, and use their large muscles is a vital part of early care and education. Active play is an essential part of the curriculum, um, especially now when we have the rising level of obesity that we are seeing with young children um, and a much more sedentary life. Children just aren't not getting as much active play as they used to. And so when we have children in an environment like um, early care and education, we have, and a, you know, in group care, it's really a wonderful time to be incorporating that develop that large muscle development and that exercise into um, the day. It's important to set aside time to go outside or when the weather prevents that to give children time and space for active indoor play. But don't think of physical activity as separate from the rest of your curriculum. For children the opportunity to be physically active needs to be sprinkled throughout the day so that they have bursts of 10 minutes or so of doing something very active, then they can settle down and do a much better job on the, rest, on the other parts of their curriculum. It does not all have to be packaged into one set of, a, of 60 to 90 minutes, which is what's recommended for the day for a child, but it can be sprinkled through the day and is actually better used that way. It's important for children to get outside and be able to move their large motor muscles differently than they can inside, certainly to be exposed to the weather and just, you know, the natural lighting and um, different surfaces in the outdoor environment. But I think the biggest benefit is really to get their bodies moving, be able to climb and jump and run, um, certainly things that they're not able to do safely in all indoor spaces. This program is divided into two one-hour segments. Each segment is made up of two sections. You'll need to answer a set of questions at the end of each section before moving on. You'll receive two hours of training credit after successfully completing the program. At the end of the program, you should be able to describe the importance to young children of vigorous active play. Understand the ways children get hurt when they're physically active and differentiate between acceptable and unacceptable risks. Recognize and respond effectively to common play area hazards. And explain the important role of adult supervision in keeping kids safe when they're engaged in active play. Every early childhood teacher can recognize the joyful sound of a group of children at loose on a playground. Young children can be so focused on having fun and testing their running, jumping, and climbing skills that they're unaware that they can get hurt. That's why they need you. This training program will help you understand how you can make sure your children have a great time being physically active without getting seriously injured. For young children, active play naturally involves testing new skills. A young child will try to run faster, swing higher, and jump from greater heights than he ever has before. Most often, children succeed or fail without consequences but sometimes they do get hurt. On average, there are about 200,000 visits to an emergency room of a hospital for playground injuries each year. These are mostly head injuries and broken bones, but in a typical year, 18 children die from injuries sustained on a playground. By far, the most common cause of serious playground injuries is falls onto hard surfaces. The single most important thing you can do to protect the children in your care is to make sure they are not exposed to the risk of falling off of a piece of play equipment onto a hard surface. If you don't have appropriate surfacing, children get a lot of head injuries. We have to remember that children, especially the younger you are, the heavier you are, you're more top heavy. Your head tends to be the heaviest part of your body as your brain is growing and developing. So when children fall, gravity naturally pulls them head first. So we have to be very careful that when children are falling that they're not receiving head injuries from hitting hard surfaces. Within this program, you'll learn about how to protect children from falls onto hard surfaces. 
But one resource you should consider if you're responsible for developing or maintaining a playground is a certified playground safety inspector, or CPSI. Well, a CPSI would help the owner-operator of a playground uh, develop a safety plan. Uh, that might include uh, a maintenance schedule, uh, inspection, uh, developing routine inspection procedures. Uh, they also will help you set up a record keeping system where you can document any injuries, any uh, maintenance uh, issues that you've had, and also help you budget for future expenses, replacing pieces of equipment. They can help you in the planning stage uh, with selecting equipment, making sure that you're selecting compliant equipment from a reputable manufacturer, um, and they can really just help you all through the process uh, and, and help you operate it once it's, once it's installed and, and you're using it. The organizations responsible for setting safety guidelines and standards for playground equipment are the Consumer Product Safety Commission and ASTM International. Any equipment your children use should comply with guidelines and standards established by these groups. Another valuable resource that can help you determine whether a playground is safe is the Handbook for Public Playground Safety. This reference book provides detailed information on the appropriate design and layout of public playgrounds. Finally, the National Recreation and Parks Association has published a prioritized list of the most common playground hazards called the Dirty Dozen. The Dirty Dozen, which identifies insufficient safety surfacing as the number one hazard, can help you focus on the most dangerous potential problems on your playground. A playground cannot and should not eliminate all risk of injury. Taking risks is how children learn what they can and cannot do with their bodies. They need opportunities to improve their skills and recognize their limitations in order to be able to evaluate for themselves the dangers around them. If they have playground equipment that, you know, is, you know, just kind of where they're at developmentally right now, they might not be able to reach that next, you know, gross motor milestone. Um, you know, I've seen children with the, the spiral that goes down the side of the playground at first, you know, they're either nervous to reach their foot out to be able to make that move to begin to use it. Um, but as they grow and develop, if they hadn't done it the week before, they continue to try and eventually they're trusting their own motor skills enough to be able to, you know, make that attempt to go down the spiral. And once they accomplish that, they begin to take other risks that are developmentally appropriate um, and help them grow in that area. I'm a strong believer that there should be some risk involved in early childhood. We want kids to learn to take appropriate risk. My belief is we look out for what I call a hazard, something that the child and sometimes for that matter adults don't even see coming. If I'm a child, if I climb on top of something, I know I've changed something about what I've done, but I may not understand that falling head first is a hazard. So we look to see how tall something is, what happens if they fall, what's the worst possible case scenario. Um, I hate to sound like a stickler, but I do believe we do have to look for worst case scenario. If the worst case scenario could result in a serious injury to a child, that child is being exposed to an unacceptable risk. A piece of equipment presenting this kind of risk is a hazard and must be removed or replaced. If active play poses the possibility of falling, for example, when a child is walking unsteadily, as long as the child is not elevated above the ground, falling is an acceptable risk, and walking for this child is not hazardous. A child falling in these circumstances is unlikely to experience a significant injury. Teachers need to understand the difference between acceptable and unacceptable risk, and should help young children manage risk. A child who is not exposed to a hazard can risk repeated minor injuries by misjudging his skills. Teachers can help a child avoid this by observing his developmental progress. It helps us to determine where the child is at and how far is the child from their um, developmental skills. Um, it also helps us determine how we can better work with that child how we can better support that child. Support is just what young children need most from their teachers. Observe young children carefully in order to determine when they are capable of identifying acceptable risks in their play environment. 
It's okay for young children to go outdoors in very hot and very cold conditions, as long as they're dressed appropriately and their activities suit the conditions. Feeling variations in weather conditions is a good experience for kids. Teachers are teaching children about weather in circle time, but they don't really have you know, any relation to weather unless they're out in it. So, some, you know, that being out in the light rain or light snow, as long as they're dressed appropriately, can be a wonderful time for them to really experience what the weather is and get a much better understanding of weather than sitting in a circle time and just hearing about it or looking out the window. During the summertime, they have to, the parents have to provide sunblock, and we put it on about 20 minutes before. And we, we check the weather before they go outside because if it's a certain um, heat index, they can't go out. I mean, they need to experience it too. We do tend to like, we'll limit it to like 10, 15 minutes for them to go out, but they still need to get outside. If it's hot, we try to stay in the shade just so they can still get out and see the fresh air and experience the outside too. Parents may not appreciate the benefits of outdoor time in hot or cold weather. Communication is key. By communicating on a regular basis as the winter starts to get a little bit colder, sending out a communication to the parents. You know, um, we do go outdoors when it is winter, when it is cold and there's snow on the ground, as long as the temperature um, isn't below um, appropriate levels. Um, so please bring in snow boots, snow pants, um, sweatshirts, whatever, hats, gloves, whatever you would need for you know, your child to be outside um, for an appropriate amount of time during the winter. Caring for Our Children, the National Standards for Out-of-Home Child Care, which is published by the American Academy of Pediatrics and American Public Health Association, has established criteria for when it is too hot or too cold for young children to be outdoors. Weather that poses a significant health risk should include wind chill factor at or below minus 15 degrees Fahrenheit and heat index at or above 90 degrees Fahrenheit, as identified by the National Weather Service. When temperatures are high, children need to be protected from the heat and sun. Going outside in the morning or late afternoon can help you avoid the hottest temperatures of the day. While you're outside, make sure everyone's skin is protected with sun protective clothing or sunscreen applied at least 15 minutes before and no more than two hours before exposure. In addition, a shaded area should be available so that children can get away from direct sunlight. Clothing should be light, loose, and comfortable. Provide drinking water so children can replace fluids. Check that play equipment, particularly metal equipment or dark-colored equipment in direct sunlight, isn't too hot to touch. Very young children have sensitive skin, and some toddlers can be burned by walking barefoot on dark-colored synthetic surfaces. When temperatures are low, children should be dressed in layers with hats and gloves to protect from the cold. Drinking water and sunscreen may still be needed. Children should not wear scarves, jewelry, jackets or sweatshirts with drawstring hoods, mittens connected by strings through the arms, or other upper body clothing with drawstrings. This clothing can become entangled in playground equipment. Opportunities to be physically active don't occur naturally for young children today. Whether we approve or disapprove of changing lifestyles, it's become the responsibility of schools and early childhood providers to make sure kids are getting the exercise they need. We are in a, now a heads-down society where everybody's looking at their screens and spending too much time in passive activity and not enough in, in active uh, play. And a lot of fa families don't realize that uh, when you're having relationships with a screen, you're not actually uh, practicing the relationships that you need to have with other human beings. Active play is a way that you can have the experience of your body, get to know your body, and often it's a group activity. It involves other people and interactions that are pretty hard to do while you're bouncing along watching us on screen or other. Our bodies evolved over many thousands of years, during which movement was essential to survive. Now, vigorous exercise is optional. But our bodies don't know that. Like the people who came before us, we think more clearly, act more calmly, and feel better when we get regular physical activity. Children and teachers need to be active. 
They utilize their gross motor skills, and um, which is part of their physical development. So at their age, they need to send off a lot of energy. So you know they utilize a lot of their um, physical skills, their gross motor skills. They're, as they're riding, they're using their arms. You know, um, they're using their legs for pedaling. They get to use their body in a way that they wouldn't get to, you know, interact outside. There's more space to run and, you know, start to get into, you know, more, you know, physical activities like playing soccer or playing basketball or, you know, um, interacting also with peers in a different way that they wouldn't necessarily get to inside the classroom. Um, as, you know, they start to grow and start to turn into older pre preschool, kindergarten, um, school age, they can start to really develop some social skills as well during the, the games that they might be able to play outside. Children need that opportunity for that physical activity so because it helps them, it helps them decompress, it helps them be able to go back into the classroom and focus, it helps them be able to manage their executive functioning better when, they're, when they've had that opportunity to have that gross motor playtime. Adults who work with young children need to recognize that active play is just as important as every other part of the curriculum. As early childhood professionals, we need to work together to educate parents and decision makers about the impact of physical activity on a child's ability to think clearly and participate effectively in the classroom community. Children love playgrounds. Climbers, swings, and slides are an endless source of joy and entertainment for kids. But a playground isn't always available, and an available playground may have hazards. So it's important to remember that young children can have a great time being active without using play equipment. Around the country, some early childhood programs and communities are experimenting with outdoor play environments that use landscaping and existing or modified natural features to create what is called a natural play environment. A natural play environment is exactly what it sounds like. It's a play environment that nature has made. We're talking hills, trees, bushes, all the things that a lot of us remember before the urbanization of America. Um, What's really cool about natural play environments is that one, they're cheap. If you have a nice hill that kids can run up and down, that does help them develop their large muscle skills. Natural play environments may be less expensive to develop and maintain than some conventional playgrounds, and they're fun for kids. But just because a play area is made up of natural elements doesn't mean it's safe. What we do with natural playgrounds when we're in, in inspecting them for safety is that we use the safety standards and guidelines. We look for all the things that we look for when we look at a, a built playground. If children are going to be climbing, for instance, on rocks or, say, logs that are put on end, something like that, and, and it's off the ground, then they do have to have some safety surfacing underneath them, just like they would need to have in a manufactured playground. If I don't know what plants are there, then I want to be very careful because there could be poison ivy, there could be poison oak, there could be something that a child is allergic to, there could be berries that are poisonous that children will eat if we're not aware of what's there. So again, I go back to thinking, what are the hazards? What are the things that the children wouldn't think about? Small risks are okay. Climbing up a hill that's not overly tall or overly steep, that's okay. Children will fall down occasionally, but if they're not falling on something that's extra hard and from a, um, a great distance, it's most likely that we're going to be talking about very minor injuries. It's when we're talking about great heights uh, we have to worry about very hard surfaces. So, when you're evaluating a natural play environment, ask the same questions you would on a playground. How high off the ground can a child get in this environment? Where can children climb? What happens if a child falls from that height? Natural play environments can be a good alternative to playgrounds, but don't let the advantages make you compromise on safety standards. To protect children from active play injuries, it helps to have a basic understanding of how children typically get hurt when they play. We'll take a more detailed look at specific equipment and types of injuries, but for now, 
let's review the reasons children are injured during active play. When you consider how young children approach active play, there are three factors that together make them susceptible to injury. First, children can become engrossed in active play. They're absorbed in their play. They focus so hard on the game or activity they're involved in that they're unaware of other children or activities that could present hazards. In this distracted state, they can easily run into one another or objects in the play area. Second, their running, jumping, and climbing skills are changing and evolving as they learn and grow. So often the only way for them to determine what they can and can't do is to try. Sometimes they overestimate their abilities. And third, children don't always understand the risks associated with play. In the excitement of trying to escape from getting caught while playing tag, a child may take chances it would be safer to avoid. There's nothing wrong with how children play. They should be absorbed, testing their skills, and unworried about risk. That's what playing is all about. It's our job as adults to provide environments and supervision that allow children to play as they want to, without getting seriously injured. Since children do get hurt on playgrounds, let's look at the types of injuries children experience. The most significant injury that children experience is head injury. That's the, the major injury that we're trying to prevent um, on the playground. The other kinds of injuries are, if a playground is not well designed, you can have a crush and shear of uh, fingers and toes. You can have head entrapment in openings where a body can get through and a head can't. You can also have entanglement injuries in which part of a child's clothing, like a drawstring from a hood, can get caught in equipment. Equipment can break or tip over if it isn't anchored properly. We'll look more closely at the causes of these types of injuries in upcoming sections of the program. Your primary role as a teacher supervising active play is to keep kids safe. That requires planning and observation so that you can make adjustments based on how the children are using the play area. They should just be looking to make sure that there's not an overwhelming amount of other children on that play space. Um, you know, even here at our center, we have four different kindergarten prep class, like preschool and kindergarten prep classrooms. So if everyone was out on the playground at the same time, that might not be the safest environment. So making sure, you know, there's a, a good amount of teacher to child ratio outside on the play space so everyone has enough space to play and can be well monitored. During the outdoor play, it's important for them to supervise properly, make sure that they're using the equipment appropriately, that they're playing safely in groups together, um, keeping them visible at all times for the teachers to be able to do that um, and monitor not only the children's interactions with each other, but you know also their use of the equipment and the amount of toys that they're bringing out and what they're doing with them. I'm a firm believer that if all the staff believe this is their break time and sit around and huddle, then we should stop paying them for their time. Um, staff have to be where the children are. Now, certain pieces of equipment may present more challenges and we may want to have staff members closer to that equipment than other pieces, but we definitely can't have them all clustered. I believe that playground supervision is almost like classroom supervision indoors. What we do is we prioritize and make sure that we still have a full view of all the children at all times, but we prioritize by the challenge presented and the guidance needed um, for each piece of equipment. In addition to giving children guidance about how to safely use play equipment, teachers should also, where appropriate, get involved in play. Not all children will engage in vigorous play on their own. Sometimes kids need their teacher to get them started and show them how to have fun during active play. Research has shown when they put accelerometers on young children that their teachers uh, really overestimate how active the children have been. When they measure how active they are, they find they're much less active than the teachers thought they were being. So it takes a real uh, co conscious effort to plan that time into the day to make sure that the children really do get that vigorous physical activity that they need. And you know, the teachers should do it with the kids and that's how they'll get some of their needs met as well.